for attending. Um, are we still talking about race, mental health in a colorblind society by Dr. You're not gonna, see I always tend to mess up her name. I kind of made it up as Keba, but it's not Keba. It's not at all. I'm pretty sure it's pronounced Karen or... <laughs> Um, but yes, so we have um, Dr. Kiva Rogers um, today, and it's going to be a really engaging, constructive conversation about mental health, about racism, and you know all sorts of other intersections too as well that we'll further talk about in our roundtable discussions. Um, first, the DMC would like to extend its gratitude to our collaborators. We have the Counseling Center. Y'all would like to raise your hands. The Counseling Center, you over there, yay! And we also have Active Minds. You all would like to raise your hands as well. And the DMC would like to extend a huge thank you to the Roundtable Coordinators for all of your time and investment. Roundtable Coordinators, can you raise your hands? Awesome. So before introducing Dr. Rogers, I just want to briefly explain the format for tonight's event. First, Dr. Rogers will present her multi-medium, very interactive lecture with Q&A. Thereafter, we're going to have a roundtable discussion about her lecture and how it applies to Hamilton College, mental health, and other intersections. At each table, there's a coordinator with questions that will facilitate this piece. Of course, during the sessions, we'll be feasting on dinner that will arrive around uh, 5.15. And I really hope this you know, style of format really encourages active learning and really community-based growth at Hamilton College. So instead of having more of a, pass a passive learning, instead of listening to a person and kind of going home and thinking about your own thoughts, we can interrogate them right here, right, with some of our community members and some of our friends. So we really hope that we really start to establish a, a new way of, of active learning in terms of lecture series here on campus, especially with a topic that's really so important for campus climate. So now I'm going to go ahead and start with the bio. Uh, Dr. Rogers has worked to improve the mental health of others for over 15 years, beginning with her role in higher education as a res residential advisor. She had a plethora of experiences since then, including but not limited to working as a school psychologist, a, therapi a therapist in a residential treatment center, a therapist consulting specialist in a college counseling center, an adjunct professor for undergraduate and graduate courses, and the senior director of health and wellness for a college. She currently works as a director of a clinical service for Boys Town in New York City and is a New York State licensed psychologist and a nationally certified school psychologist. Dr. Rogers considers herself a mental health professional that assists adolescents, adults, and families in working together effectively in promotion of their mental, emotional, and social health and well-being. This is accomplished through evidence-based clinician work with clients as well as consultation, collaboration, and training with key stakeholders in their lives. Additionally, this is accomplished through innovative work with administrative assistance, enhancing community engagement in diversity and inclusion. Dr. Roger, Rogers' areas of specialty include helping communities move from a focus on transactional diversity to transformational inclusion, and working with clients who have experienced trauma, have severe emotional and behavioral disorders, learning disabilities, are marginalized, belong to historically underserved and underrepresented groups, and are limited by institutional barriers. So we're really, again, so excited um, for Dr. Rogers, to, Dr. Rogers to come for this, I'm anticipating, amazingly awesome event for tonight. And again, thank you so much all for coming um, to help out with this event and to overall participate and lend your ears and your voices for this particular event. It means um, so much to the Naismith Solo Center. So without further ado, please allow me and join me and welcome uh, Dr. Rogers to this amazing presentation. And 
trying to make it tailored to this particular community and what you guys would like to know more about. I'm going to be doing a number of different things. Um, first, I'm going to show a couple of videos, and then we'll have a couple of questions and interaction after that. But the videos, just for clarity, are for the purpose of making sure that we're all kind of on the same page, or at least in the same book, even if we're not on the same page, so that we understand what we're talking about. When you have a topic such as this, you know, we're still talking about race, First of all, the assumption is everybody understands um, what racism is and what we're talking about when we refer to race. That's not necessarily true. So I just want to have a brief video about that. Um, before I get into that, I want to discuss the rules of engagement. Yes, there are rules, and I know I don't belong here, but I'm making up rules. <laughs> so the rules are that, you know, I expect to be respected, of course, but more important than that, I expect you all to respect each other. I am a fan of challenging folks, their ideas, but not the person. So I ask that as topics come up, as discussion happens, not only while I'm speaking, but also on a round table, that we really openly and critically think about what's being said and consider that there might be an opinion other than ours. Can you agree to that? Yeah. Can everyone agree to that, or just some people? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of y'all, I was about to tell y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, after my face life, I think I was a comedian. I still have those, those drives. I also was a track star in my previous life. Sometimes those things come out, so, you know, just bear with me. Um, so, that's one thing. I also want to put a little disclaimer. I recognize that there are some things that we're going to be talking about that are pretty uncomfortable, and you might feel like you can't tolerate that, or you may need to take a break, take a breath. I am a psychologist, a clinician first, and so I would ask that if you need space, if you need time, please do whatever it is that you need to do to take care of yourself. I would not take offense if someone gets up to leave. I will assume that it's because you need a break and not because you think that's up. So, that will be my assumption, so don't worry about it. For those of you who get up because you think I suck, don't worry about it, because I'm assuming it's because you <laughs> So, um, but seriously, just to make sure that you do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself if things get really wrong. Okay? So, our agenda for the, this talk, uh, we're going to have a brief history of racism in America. This is a very short clip, about eight minutes of... Um, I can say it does a fairly okay job, um, but in terms of it being an eight minute clip and me trying to talk in eight minutes about racism in, in America, I'm going to go with the eight minute clip. Because <laughs> what might start out as an intended eight minutes for me will end up very differently. Then we're going to talk about the three levels of racism. So when we speak about race and racism and the impact on mental health, what exactly are we talking about? We need to be clear on that before we can start talking about the impact. So we're going to talk about the impact on mental health. I'll go over a couple of studies, but i got to tell you, I'm not a researcher. Not at all. I am a researcher in the sense that I had to complete a dissertation. I enjoy reading other people's research, but I'm not interested, right? Perpetual student life, not for me. So, I really want this conversation to, I mean, I put research in there because you know, that's what you have to do when you're a doctor and that's all. Expecting research. So I did that. But understand that we're going to really try to take this and apply it to what it means for us. Okay? Coping strategy. Now these are just my ideas, and we're going to talk a little bit more in the roundtable discussion about what some coping strategies are that are not listed that you might think you need to use here at hand. We're going to kind of take some questions uh, prior to us opening up for the roundtable discussion. And then I'm going to end with a breathing exercise. It's called diaphragmatic breathing. And as I already mentioned, I recognize that these topics can be somewhat uncomfortable and can raise anxiety for folks. So I'm going to try to bring your physiological response down, use all my big words, and do a breathing exercise at the end so that we can kind of come down and be able to think more rationally and engage more fully in our roundtable discussion. Okay? Did I lose that already? It's just the beginning. <laughs> oh, and by the way, I'm like honorary Hamilton right now. <laughs> so, whatever y'all. 
I'll say it doesn't matter. <laughs> How did the idea of race begin in America? The answer can be found in the long and complex history of Western Europe and the United States. It is that history, influenced by science, government, and culture, that has shaped our ideas about race. When European colonists first arrived on North American shores beginning in the 1500s, the land was already inhabited by Native Americans. The Spanish, French, and English encountered frequent conflicts with indigenous peoples while trying to establish settlements in Florida, the northeast area bordering Canada, the Virginia colony, and the southwest. By the 1600s, English colonists had established a system of indentured servitude that included both Europeans and Africans. But by the time of Bacon's Rebellion in the mid-1670s, an insurrection involving white and black servants against wealthy Virginia planters, the status of Africans had begun to change. They were no longer servants who had an opportunity for freedom following servitude, but instead were relegated to a life of permanent slavery in the colonies. In the 1770s, English colonists in the U.S. became involved in a rebellion of their own. This time, the opposition was the British Crown. But while the colonists battled the British for independence, they continued to deny Africans their freedom and withhold rights to Native Americans. Ironically, one of the first casualties of the Revolutionary War was Crispus Attucks, the runaway slave of African and Indian parentage. Before the idea of race emerged in the U.S., European scientist Carolus Linnaeus published a classification system in Systema Naturae in 1758 that was applied to humans. Thomas Jefferson was among those who married the idea of race with a biological and social hierarchy. Jefferson, a Virginia slave owner who helped draft the Declaration of Independence and later became president, was influential in promoting the idea of race that recognized whites as superior and Africans as inferior. Jefferson wrote in 1776 in Notes on the State of Virginia, quote, Blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to the whites in the endowments both of body and mind, unquote. Scientists were among those who were influenced by these ideas and began to develop their own theories about race. In the 18th and 19th centuries, scientists influenced by Enlightenment philosophers developed a system of categorizing things in nature, including humans. Although Carolus Linnaeus was the first to develop a biological classification system, it was German scientist Johann Blumenbach who first introduced a race-based classification of humans, which established a framework for analyzing race and racial differences for the next hundred years. By the 19th century, the debate over race centered around two theories. One theory was that different races represented different species. The other was that humans were one species and that race represented variation in the human species, a view that was compatible with the teachings of the Bible. Among those who espoused the multiple species theory, or polygyny, were Philadelphia physician Samuel Morton and European scholar Louis Agassiz. Their work was popular in the mid-19th century. The most prominent scientist who believed in monogyny, that all humans were one species, was Charles Darwin. By the mid-19th century, scientific debates over race had entered the mainstream culture and served to justify slavery and mistreatment. Some, like plantation doctor Samuel Cartwright, tried to explain the tendency of slaves to run away by coining the term drapetomania and prescribed whipping as a method of treatment. Though there was resistance to slavery in both the U.S. and Europe, scientists, for the most part, continued to advance theories of racial inferiority. The abolitionist movement of the 19th century sought to humanize the plight of African slaves in various ways to influence political power and public opinion. The resistance to slavery and the image of Africans as subhuman can be found in protest hymns like Amazing Grace, which was written by John Newton in 1772 in response to the horrors he witnessed working on an English slave ship. One of the ways that race played out in popular culture was in the publication in 1852 of the most widely read novel of its time, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, which depicted a more realistic portrait of slavery and tried to humanize slaves. The 19th century also marked a period of widespread racialization, not just of African Americans, but of Native Americans, Mexican Americans, and Chinese Americans as well. 
Much of the racializing of non-Europeans and even the Irish served an economic and political purpose. African slavery, for instance, provided free labor and added political clout for slaveholding states in the South. Taking Native American land and belittling Native American cultures was made easier by defining Native people as savages. At the end of the 19th century, the U.S. experienced another wave of European immigration. This time, the immigrants were Southern and Eastern Europeans, and their presence challenged ideas about race. Specifically, who was white and who was not. Unlike earlier European immigrants, who were mostly German, Scandinavian, and Irish, these newer immigrants were Polish, Italian, and Jewish, and brought with them customs and traditions that were different from their European predecessors. They were often the victims of discrimination. Even U.S. immigration policy tried to limit the number of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe by imposing quotas. At the beginning of the 20th century, African Americans migrated north for factory jobs that opened up during World War I and to escape the violence in the South. Between 1889 and the early 1920s, roughly 50 to 100 lynchings a year took place in the U.S. While blacks were mostly the victims, Italian Americans, Asian Americans, and Jews were also lynched. Even in the North, blacks encountered racism as they competed with whites for jobs. Several northern cities, St. Louis, Tulsa, Detroit, and Chicago, among others, were the sites of major race riots from 1915 to the early 1920s. During the Depression, some race scientists sought to justify economic and social inequality by attributing certain characteristics, such as criminal behavior, work ethic, and intelligence, to race, using a theory of genetic inheritance. In other words, you were poor, or a criminal, or less intelligent, because it was in your genes. This idea was the basis for eugenics. Charles Davenport, the director of the Eugenics Records Office, was among the scientists who promoted these ideas. The eugenicist expert testimony was influential in getting Congress to pass the Immigration Act of 1924, and provided the social framework embraced by Nazi Germany. By World War II, the U.S. had expanded the racial categories of the census to include various ethnic groups, among them Mexicans, Japanese, Indians from Asia, and Filipinos. These categories and the demographics associated with each group would be used to limit immigration as well as provide the statistical data to analyze racial discrimination in the U.S. that followed in the post-war era. The 1950s and 60s were a time of enormous social change in the U.S. Discrimination and institutional racism were being challenged at every turn. To some extent, the racial and social hierarchies that had long been accepted were being contested. And perhaps more slowly, attitudes about race and racial difference were beginning to change. The way we view race and ethnicity today is far more complex than the simple categories in the first U.S. Census. In fact, in the 2000 census, the Mark One or More option allowed for 63 possible racial combinations reflecting the diversity of the country. By the year 2010, the U.S. population will barely resemble what it was 400, 100, even 20 years ago. That means we will probably have to reconsider the term race and whether it is relevant to describing who and what we are. Something that 
about three and three and a half hours long, but it's worth your time. If you want to know more.
So I think that we have moved a lot from where things used to be. There I say in a somewhat more inclusive way. But because we have moved and tipped the scale just slightly, and oh, we have a black, by the way, president, right, who is very clearly mixed race. Do we all know that? Mm -hmm. He is not a black president. Now, when I'm being a jerk, I also say, you know, my president is black. So I want to feel good about that. But he's the president. We are a free world. Come on. <laughs> so, however, he gets to check more than one box, too. Right? So, things have changed, we've progressed, but it's not over. Yes. So I was just wondering, would it, is it fair to say that Native Americans are the longest to oppressed group in the United <laughs> States? Because they were here, went just when the Europeans arrived, even before our slaves were brought over to the United States. So the difference, I'm glad you said that, because I should have addressed that. The difference is, yes, Native Americans were here first. The difference is, um, the Europeans kind of said after a while, you know, we're done with you. Go govern yourselves. Right? Kind of do your thing over there. And they were kind of left to do their own thing over there versus being forced to do what the Europeans wanted them to do. Now, before somebody goes off, <laughs> I'm not by any means suggesting that that was wonderful and nice. I'm saying that that's the major difference between the two groups, is that one group was allowed to kind of go and figure out how to self-govern, even though, you know, that didn't really work out so well. Um, and one group was forced and oppressed and kind of not really helped. You're outside, boys. Just to tap in quickly on the uh, Native American score, uh, I do want to say also that um, there were continued extermination attempts by the U.S. government leading up past 1900. An armed conflict persisted between tribal nations and the U.S. until the late 1970s. And I think part of the reason we talk about African American slavery so much as opposed to the enslavement of the indigenous people or the genocide of the indigenous people, which killed estimatedly in the neighborhood of 100 million, um, is because we believe that all of them died, when in fact there are still millions of them living among us today. So we believe that, I'm sorry. We believe that the First Nations all went extinct and that there are no indigenous people left when the fact is a lot of us are descended from them in one way or another. And uh, I think sometimes we lose track of the fact that these groups are not extinct and maybe that's why we're losing sight of the bigger picture and grappling so much with the experiences of this one group, which I'm not saying are not important, but I don't necessarily think it's accurate to say that black Americans faced a greater or more persistent racial struggle than Native Americans did, because even the self-governance that we allowed was a 
genocide by strangling versus gunshot. So let me correct something, because what I did not say was a greater show. I was very careful to choose my words, and I did not acknowledge one over the other. What I said was long-standing and persistent, and that, whether you want to accept that or not, that's your prerogative, but that is true. Those are facts, not my opinion. So the difference, again, is being kind of thumbed under uh, and being seen as inferior and your daily existence being kind of enshrined in that versus being able in some ways and at some points to govern, self-govern. So that's just my opinion of that. But again, I say please do take a look at the video. One which she knows to have rich, fertile soil, and one which she knows to have poor, rocky soil. And she has seed for the same kind of flowers, except some of the seed is going to produce pink blossoms, and some is going to produce red blossoms. And the gardener cook. So what does she do? She takes the red seed, and she puts it in the rich, fertile soil. And she takes the pink seed, and she puts it in the poor, rocky soil. And three weeks later, she comes, and she's looking at her flower boxes, and what she notices is that every single one of the red seeds has sprouted. And some of the seed is tall, some of the red flowers are tall and strong and flourishing. The weak seed in the red at least has sprouted and made it to a mitten height. But when she looks in the pink box, in that poor rocky soil, the weak pink seed has died. And the strong pink seed is just struggling, struggling to make it to a mitten height. And then those flowers go to seed. 
And the next year, the same thing happens. And then those fathers go to sea. And year after year, the same thing happens. Until finally, ten years later, the gardener's looking at her flower boxes and she says, you know, I was right to prefer red over pink. Now we'll interrupt that to say that this first part of the story is how institutionalized racism works. You had the initial historical insult of the separation of the seed into the two types of soil. You had the flower boxes, the contemporary structural factors, keeping the soil separate. And then through inaction in the face of need, perpetuation of that difference. But now we're going to pick the story back up and say, well, where would personally mediated racism be in this garden? Well, that's when the garden was looking at her flowers, and she said, those pink flowers are so scraggly and scrawny, and she plucks those blossoms off before they can even go to seed. Or she might notice that a pink seed has blown into the rich fertile soil and she plucks it out before it can establish itself. And then where would internalized racism be in this garden? Well, you have the pink flowers in their box trying to make it looking over at red, which is all flourishing and flaunted. And here come the bees. And the bees are minding their own business. They're just collecting nectar, but they're calling them at the same time. So you can use button on. Here come the bees to the pink flowers. <laughs> And it comes over to this one pink flower, and the pink flower says, Get away from me, bees! Don't bring me any of that pink pollen. I prefer the red. Because the pink flower has internalized that red is better than pink. So then the question arises, what do we do to set things right in this garden? Well, you could say, well, let's address the internalized racism. So we're going to go over to the pink flowers, and we're going to say, Pink is beautiful. Power to the pink! which might make the pink flowers feel better, but that in and of itself is not going to change the conditions in which they live. Or you could say, okay, well, I understand that. Let's address the personal mediated racism. So let's go talk to the gardener, or better yet, let's have a workplace multicultural workshop for the gardener, which is all good. But we're going to say, dear gardener, would you please stop plucking those pink flowers? And maybe she will, or maybe she won't. But even if she does, it's not going to change the situation in which the pink flowers find themselves. What you really need to do if you want to set things right in this garden is to address the institutionalized racism. So you have to either break down the boxes and mix up the soil, or if you want to keep separate boxes, that's okay too, although to me it makes it easier to segregate resources. But if you want to keep separate boxes, then you have to enrich that poor, rocky soil until it's as rich as the rich fertile soil. And when you do that, you know the pink flowers will flourish. They will look grand and beautiful and wonderful. Maybe even better than the red, because they have, after all, been selected for survival and strength, which is a very, very interesting notion. And then once those pink flowers are flourishing, they'll no longer be looking over at red, wanting to be red. So you have also addressed the internalized racism. And in addressing the institutionalized racism, you may even address the personally mediated racism. Now, the original gardener may have to go to her grave, preferring red over pink. But her children, seeing the flowers equally beautiful, would be less likely to adopt that attitude. So this story has very quickly been to illustrate these three levels of racism, institutionalized, personally mediated, and internalized, and to very strongly suggest that if we want to set things right in the garden, we have to at least address the institutionalized racism. We can address the other levels at the same time, but we have to at least address the institutionalized racism, and when we do, the other levels may take care of themselves. It's just one last piece to the story, which is the important question, who is the gardener? After all, the gardener is the one that I've given the power to decide, the power to act, and control the resources. And who is this gardener really? Well, certainly government is part of the gardener. You know, sometimes I joke and say, well, maybe the rich people behind government are part of the gardener. Maybe we can be our own gardener in communities if we have this power to decide, power to act, and control of resources, which is what I also describe as self-determination. But whoever the gardener is, whoever's going to have this power, it's very important that the gardener be concerned with equity. If the gardener is not concerned with equity, then you'll have the scrawny looking pink flowers and the pretty red flowers, and the gardener will be thinking that the garden is beautiful, when in fact it is not.
racism that occurs in the Act of so, you know, students will say, well, I don't think we're racist because by you saying that we're racist, you're assuming that I'm racist. And I'm not a racist. I don't, I don't tell, um, like, I don't tell, I don't know, my black classmate not to go into the same bathroom because he's black or something. Um, and I think that this is one of the, like, I'm kind of glad that we saw this video because it, it definitely separates the three forms and how they're um, important, but also the, the bigger picture that it's not just about being consciously racist, but being factors that continue to, and being people that continue to enforce something like internalized and even more um, institutionalized racism. fantastic with this female guy who was explaining to her, you know, and to the audience why, um, you know, women should be glad to be cat called, women like nothing more than to be told that they're attractive. I mean, he was explaining. Okay, wait, was this so, a serious conversation? Yes, it was, it was. It was mind boggling. Oh, okay. but, um, I heard you say comedians online. Oh, no, sorry. The, uh, okay. Actually, that, that's a good point. The, um, the woman who they asked to talk about it, um, I'm not sure how they selected her, because I just saw one of those snippets, but, um, but she was actually quite terrific. Um, and, um, she wrote a book, she wrote a book on something like that. Oh, yeah, um, she was like an expert or something. I she see, I see, yeah. It was, it was actually, I saw it under the heading of man's book, you know, where he explained to us with how we should so what would that be an example of? Oh, that's actually, I'd say, a melding of institutionalized and personal. And in terms of it, it, all three of them, I'd say. You know, that it's, it's definitely, you know, a very entrenched public social phenomenon that has a control and structure, so it means one. Um, it's individuals who are engaging it, so it means two, and it certainly has an effect on, you know, women's feelings about safety in public space.
you can see that they push the man and talk to the woman and they put the higher speeding on top and all this stuff. The man and then women are soft with softer and then less speed and all this stuff. Uh, but I think that that's changing a little by little and this this uh, woman called Monet something, to her name. Monet Williams, yeah, and she threw the first page of a World Series baseball game this uh, the last World Series and she throws about 70 miles an hour and which is like but, and she, I think, I think her team, yeah. So she's very ready to compete with, like, the professional baseball player, male baseball player. And she plays baseball, she doesn't play softball. So she recruits this one. Um, maybe this is just me, but I'm having a little trouble applying all concepts of gender to, to the gardener theory. I'm hoping to do that. Um, I'm, trying, I'm having a little trouble applying this theory to all aspects of gender, and I was hoping maybe you were somebody else could say some nice for me because when when I whenever I hear this concept of gender, it it's also, the, what always bothers me is the theory that there are only two genders, male and female, and there's nothing. That's what I was thinking somebody might say actually. And that there was nothing else. That's an example of institutionalized, right? Like we only have these two genders. This is what we acknowledge. Because then I would, I would more like to know how do you apply this gardener's theory to somebody who's transgender or transsexual? And oh, so this is applied because it's institutionalized that we're not even acknowledging it. Mm -hmm. You don't exist. So in the system, there is no space for you. That's an example of institutionalized discrimination. Does that help? Yeah, it does help. It's just that it's not even, most of the time, it's not even talked about. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's like, exactly. And because it's so, it's so much a part of the system, we just don't even acknowledge it.
We really have to think about the impact on those who are directly affected by these particular situations. And again, this is not just racism, as we just discussed. This is also discrimination across categories, right? So perfect example of transgender, what, you know, what, what does that look like? Why is nobody even having the conversation, right? We finally got to the point of like some campuses having gender neutral bathrooms, but that's just some. That's not even like required, right? So when we think about this, when we think about the impact on mental health, let me just poll you guys. Just kind of shout out, what do, you, what do you think prior to you doing any research or anything on the impact of racism on mental health, just from you knowing your friends, knowing people that you know that have experienced these things, what do you think are some of the impacts of racism on mental health? Depression. Just go ahead and shout it out. Higher so, level of stress. So higher stress, yeah. Depression. Depression. Anxiety. Anxiety. Low self-esteem. Denial. Slavery. Slavery. Yeah. What else? Shame. Double, double conscious. Should somebody say shame? Shame. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're on 
social determinants of health. And mental health, if anybody is surprised by this, usually has the strongest association over any other physical health aspects. Okay? So I'm not going to do that. But those are the social determinants of health. That's what we will grab. It's nice. We look at it. So um, as I said, so there was a, a systematic review. Basically, the point of this is, and the point of most, most of the studies, is it's trying to provide evidence that racial discrimination is a critical aspect or determinant of health. That is the whole point of this area of research, is basically saying, OK, you know what? Let us do some more research. Let's provide you more evidence that this is important and we need to talk about it. Why has that been on the rise since 2000, do you think? Since about the time that we started saying, what race? Why are we still talking about that in America? By the way, I'm not talking about just black people. I'm talking about folks of color. Okay? So this study um, was actually one that was done across <coughs> four or five different countries. Uh, African American, uh, Asian, Native American, Latino. And basically the whole point was that, you know, depression, anxiety, those things were really Excuse me, racism really impacted those negatively. But it was interesting because there's also the aspect that as racism increases, what decreases? The positive mental health or our coping strategies, right? So self esteem, self regard, resilience, those things decrease as you're more impacted by racism. The main uh, uh, difference in age groups, which this was kind of crazy, but the age was actually 0 to 18 across the studies. I don't know what they did with the babies, but okay. Um, and of course, they found that the adolescents obviously had stronger associations because they're adolescents and they do things more freely about themselves. Um, so this was just with African American adults. I chose this because it, again, was a meta-analysis. And so the interesting thing about research in this area is if you choose a study, or you can kind of find something to support what it is that you want to say, okay? So I wanted to stay away from that and just give you kind of globally, this is what is being found. Same difference, didn't matter if it was studies that used college population or the population in the community, sample size in the community, the same thing, depression, anxiety, except that this actually found was matched by somatization and PTSD symptoms. So, this was actually making the argument not only is health, uh, racism an important determinant of health, but we really need to start looking at PTSD symptoms in the African American male population or adult population. Now, here's what I really wanted to get to post traumatic stress slave syndrome. How many of you have ever heard of that? Okay, so please write this down because I'm not going to do this justice but I'm going to try. Dr. Joy DeGroy, D-E-G-R-U-Y, uh, wrote a book, has a theory called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. She did her research for her dissertation on this, went to Africa, you know, kind of differences in the African culture and African American culture. Basically what she says is Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome is multi-generational trauma that continues throughout generations, together with continued oppression and absence of opportunity to access the 
picture crabs in a barrel, literally crabs in a barrel. And when as one crab tries to climb up to get out of the barrel, another crab pulls the crab down. Right? You can't go anywhere. Right? They talk to each other. Did you know that? <laughs> so, you know, the, this happens repeatedly. The crab I'm trying to get up. The other crab says, no, come back down here with us. This is where we all are. Right? So, Due to racial socialization or adopting the attitudes of white America as the standard for any other culture, this is what leads to that. It's kind of like, hey, well, if, if, if Dr. So this is actually experienced a lot. Um, if Dr. Rogers is now Dr. Rogers, and she came from where I came from, what does that say about me? Who am I? Why am I not Dr. Somebody? So instead of being happy for me, there's a present and consistent and persistent diminishing of my accomplishments. Um, so for example, one of my friends, from like seven years old, we've been friends. One of my friends said, I was so excited you know, when I got my PhD, because you know, it's a struggle. If you don't know, you will know if you get a PhD. <laughs> it's a struggle, and that's why you must use the title doctor. Mm -hmm. um, so, I was on the struggle bus for a long time. I mean, I was on the bus. I drove the bus. <laughs> Encourage folks to tell 
You know, somebody might say to you, you know what? <clears throat> Here's my shuttle bus. I've been on this for years. You want to ride? <laughs> so you can say, no, we're going to take the train. <laughs> right? Because you're getting off the shuttle bus. I want to help you get off the shuttle bus. Does anybody know what I mean by shuttle bus? Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that we all have that. <laughs> okay, so make sure that you listen. Open your minds to be able to hear not only about racism, but discrimination. Here is the struggle. Okay? Learn your history in all of its glory and its shame. Whatever that history is, that's the history of being a woman. That's the history of being whatever. Just learn it. Know it. Accept the positive things about it, not only the negative things. We tend to look at our history and say, I want to deal with that because that doesn't make me feel good. But what, you, what I would ask you to consider, those things that you might feel not so proud of, recognize that you have your people, whichever people those are, have gotten through those things. They have survived, and they expect that you survive as well. So learn it. Get familiar with it. Be proud of it. Figure out what you're going to do differently. Know yourself. I know this is your mission. That was on purpose. <laughs> In what ways do you bring value to this world? When we think about self-esteem, what is your work? And not just, you know, yay, you're awesome. We tend to do that to each other. Very envy, right? I walk around all day talking about how awesome I am. I joke about that, but I'm real, right? Because I'm awesome. So when somebody asks me, you know, why are you so awesome? Oh, I'm awesome because if you understood my beginning, you would have a greater appreciation for this current position. I'm awesome because not only do I care, but I'm good at what I do. And I strive harder every day to be better. That's why I'm awesome. So I can joke and I can laugh, but I understand what my value is, right? You all need to know what your value is. And not on the surface level. What do you really bring? What is it that you're working for? Maybe you don't bring it yet, but you're going to bring it. You know you're going to bring it. It ain't there yet, but you got it. You're working on it. It's right here. Bring that with you. My awesomeness is right here. It's coming. This piece of my awesomeness is not fully extended just yet, but it's coming. Okay? Get help if needed. Seek out someone who's aware of racism, discrimination, or whatever. And that gets told you things. Stop talking to people who make you feel worse about your situation. <laughs> Stop talking to people who make you feel worse about your situation. Find someone who you can talk to who can not only just sit and commiserate and say, oh, well, don't worry about that. I'm sure it didn't mean it that way. Or, oh, yeah, you're right, that sucks. Find someone who you can talk to and say, you know what, that does suck. And here's what I would suggest you can do. Be an ally. That's a repeat of statement number one, but I still need it. Okay? Um, I think that was it. I was going to show you a cool joke, but you know, that's not good. <laughs> so, I'm not going to take questions because I see Kimberly wants to kill me. But what I will say <laughs> is, I would like to end with a diaphragmatic breathing exercise because I really want the conversation that we have at our 